Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining this Positive Action panel, which is a collaboration between the Net Zero Initiative and the Matilda Centre at the University of Sydney. My name is Alice Motion, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this Positive Action panel this evening. Before we start tonight's event, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners uh, on which the University of Sydney is built, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. There is no place in Australia, water, land or air, that has not been known, nurtured or loved by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. And noting that we're joining from different places across Australia, I'd like to extend an acknowledgement of country to the traditional owners of the land where you are this evening. Um, this evening, we're going to hear from some wonderful panellists, um, and we're also going to have an opportunity to ask questions of those panellists, so I'd encourage you to please put your questions into the Q&A panel, and we'll get to you uh, towards the end of the discussion if we have time, so please uh, do post those questions throughout this evening's event. And um, before we, we start, I'd like to introduce you to the two people who are the, the masterminds behind this event, two colleagues of mine at the University of Sydney. Um, so please, could I welcome um, Erin Kelly and Deanna D'Alessandro to tell us a little bit more about this, how this event came about. Sure, thank you, Alice. Um, so firstly, I became concerned about the impact of climate change on young people's mental health when I was working as a clinical psychologist with young people and a lot of my clients were expressing distress and I didn't know what to do. There was sort of no guidelines around how to manage climate change distress. Um, and then I started to look out for those resources, but then also wanting to do something to help either through my work um, in research at the Matilda Centre or in other ways. So um, yeah, this is part of that. So yes, um, as Erin mentioned, this is very much inspired by positive action. So as a scientist um, leading one of the teams in the School of Chemistry, working on technologies that are relevant to um, solutions to, to climate change, um, we were very much discussing how we feel empowered um, in terms of the research we do and, um, and how that might be able to help others to let them know that there are very much positive actions that, that can be done. So that's very much the spirit in which we're here this evening. Alice, back to you. Thank you so much, Erin and Deanna. Lovely to hear from you and to hear about how science and psychology can come together uh, to collaborate on projects such like such as this. Um, also, I, we'd just like to note too that um, although this is a positive action panel this evening, we, we know that some of the topics that we're discussing um, are quite distressing and we are talking about anxiety and particularly anxiety in young people um, and we don't have any crisis crisis workers on hand um, to offer support this evening but we'd like to share um, some contact information uh, of, and resources that you can access should you need to discuss um, anything with anyone uh, about what's discussed this evening so please do take advantage of uh, those links that are shared in the chat. Uh, right now. So before we begin our discussion, I'd like to take a moment to introduce our absolutely fantastic panel this evening. We have a short bio for each of them, which I'll share with you now, but you'll hear more from each of them in, in just a moment. So first up, we have Sam Wenger, who is a PhD student at the University of Sydney, and Sam is co-leading the Musk Foundation Student X Prize. His PhD focuses on direct air capture he was a direct air capture consultant at the Bipartisan Policy Centre in Washington, D.C. and authors RemoveCarbon.co. Next up, we have Cheryl Au, who is the chairperson at the Matilda Centre and the Premise Youth Advisory Board. The Youth Advisory Board provides input into the governance and research priorities of Premise and contributes to specific youth-focused research projects. Welcome, Cheryl. Next up, we have Dr. Susie Burke, who is a psychologist, researcher, writer, and climate change campaigner with a background in individual and couples therapy, group work, conflict resolution, disaster psychology, parenting issues, and environmental issues. Susie helps people to cope with and come to terms with climate change and disasters. So welcome, Susie. Next up, we have Carol Ride, who is a psychologist and founder of Psychology for a Safe Climate. 
She's worked as a therapist and trainer for more than 30 years and has been involved in the climate movement since, movement since 2006, helping to form a local community climate action group. Her shift to work in the field of climate change as a psychologist and activist is motivated by the urgent need to contribute to engaging and supporting people in responding to the unfolding climate crisis. Welcome, Carol. And last but by no means least, we have Louise Shepherd, who is a clinical psychologist with 25 years of experience. She was introduced to acceptance and commitment therapy, also known as ACT, in 2004 and became a peer reviewed trainer in 2012. Louise works as a therapist, supervisor, trainer and executive coach and is the director of the Sydney ACT Centre. Being a mum is what drives her commitment to climate action. Alongside her clinical work, she's involved with the Australian Parents for Climate Action, which is a not-for-profit group of parents who are working towards a safe and sustainable future for their children and future generations. So, wow, what a fantastic panel. Um, we're delighted to welcome you all this evening. We're very lucky that we're going to hear from you today, and I'm sure this is going to be a fantastic session. So I'll start with my first question that's for Cheryl. Um, we'll come to you first. Um, as the chair of a youth advisory board, what do you think are the main concerns that young people have when it comes to climate change? And how does this affect mental health, particularly among young people? Really great question. I think a lot of it for young people is that in our generation, a lot of things have changed through the climate and it feels like a lot of times we're powerless to do anything about it. And I've heard a lot from my friends and people and young people I've met that a lot of the changes are growing on the environment. They want to contribute, but they don't know how. And that sometimes the changes feels too big and overwhelming for them to handle, especially with um, the bushfires and the Queensland floods, which I have experienced. It hits a lot of people hard, but especially for young people when they still don't have the grounding in society yet, when they still are trying to find their way to throughout the world to earn money to study and stuff. But on top of it, they're working with an environment that they don't know if it will support them in the future and wanted to contribute to a better future, not for just for themselves, but for the future people. And not being able to do that can lead to a lot of anxiety. But I also think on the flip side, uh, it's really allowed for young people to be aware of a lot of things going in our world and wanting to be proactive and to change. So I think there's pros and cons and having a um, way to be able to make change like this forum where as a young person I can speak about my experiences and work with people who are making those changes are uh, a great opportunity for young people to feel more in control of the future and take care of the environment and you know take charge of the mental health. Thank you so much, Cheryl. And um, I think, you know, in your role um, with the Matilda Centre uh, as chair of the, the Youth Advisory Board, it, it's great to hear that that voice is being heard um, in many conversations. So thank you for all that you do. Um, Sam, we might come to you next. So you're a PhD student. I think you're, you're working in the School of Chemistry. Um, and I'd really like to know, how did you become interested in carbon removal technologies? And I introduced you as somebody who's worked in direct air capture. But what does that actually mean? So uh, I'll start with the, the second question first. So direct air capture is actually a form of carbon removal. Um, there's plenty of ways to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Kind of the most straightforward are um, planting trees, enhancing enhancing coastal blue carbon, things like that. Direct air capture is an engineered solution in which we can use materials that are highly adsorbent for capturing CO2, and we can capture large volumes of CO2 at scale. Um, and the way that I kind of got involved with this is in 2018, an IPCC report came out and it suggested that even with large scale efforts to mitigate emissions, that we need to start capturing about 10 to 20 billion tons of CO2 out of the year, out of the air by 2050, which is a huge effort. And one of my professors at my master's, um, he told me that really there's only a few thousand people that are working on this at the moment. And I saw an opportunity to make an impact. And so I reached out to Deanna, 
And um, now I'm one of Deanna's PhD students in the School of Chemistry working to make materials that can capture CO2. Thanks, Sam. And I think um, uh, Deanna and all of us are delighted that you reached out. Um, it's great to have um, such fantastic scientists working on this, this research. Um, Susie, we might come to you next. Um, as we heard from your introduction, you have uh, many hats, as most of the folks here on the panel do today. Um, firstly, I'd like to ask you, um, what does being a climate change campaigner involve? Um, and then secondly, um, in your practice as a psychologist, um, how do you help people to cope with and come to terms with climate change and disasters? Um, could you share a little bit of that with us, please? Sure. Thank you climate change campaigner well I suppose it covers a whole lot of things so it it covers being an activist and doing you know direct action um, in com with community groups you know to protest coal fired power stations and getting out into the shipping lanes in Newcastle and stopping the coal ships and things like that but also in my role as a psychologist when I was working at the Australian Psychological Society it would also involve going and talking to um, Parliament about, um, and to, you know, government inquiries about things related to the psychology of climate change and behaviour change and wind farms and a whole host of things that I was involved with then. Um, and I guess it also involves being an advocate and being a part of the Climate and Health Alliance and um, you know, being um, interested in and involved in the work that um, Carol does with Psychology for a Safe Climate and being able to talk uh, publicly about the importance of uh, social science and, and climate change and looking at the contributions that we can make to understanding how humans are contributing to the problem of climate change and the impact that climate change has on us in terms of our mental health and also the ways in which we can contribute to solutions, all of which require changes in human behaviour and that's something that social scientists or psychologists are, are trained to be experts in. So I guess that covers some of what being a climate change campaigner might mean in the context of myself personally but also as a psychologist. Uh, so that was the first question and the second question was about what do I do to work with people to help them cope. Well one of the things that I've been doing in the last several years is writing articles with other psychologists, um, a couple of developmental psychologists, um, around the impacts that climate change has on young people and adults. And one of the models that we use a lot is the transactional stress and coping model, which has been around since last um, since last century. Um, but uh, it's a really useful model that uh, Maria Ojala, a Swedish psychologist, brought back into um, sort of popular um, usage or familiarity in the work that she did. Um, uh, working with young people in Sweden and looking at the ways in which they cope with climate change. And so it's a very useful model for sort of looking at the different things that we can um, do to help us and to help young people cope. And so the three uh, coping strategies that are covered in that stress and um, that transactional stress and coping model are problem-focused coping, which is all the things that we do and we do things with our legs and our arms and our words. So all the things that we do to reduce the thing that is causing the stress, uh, which in this case is climate change. So those are all the things that we do to mitigate the threat of climate change when we take action on climate change or to adapt to the threat of climate change. So that's the problem focused coping strategies. And then so that's in a thing. That's the air direct air capture work that Sam is doing. And it's the it's the being a part of groups and it's putting on events like this as well um, as as it is, you know, joining in protests and advocating and doing household activities and doing group plant tree plantings and all those sorts of things. Um, and then the second one, and they're in no particular order, is um, emotion-focused coping strategies. So these are the things that we do to manage or make room for the uncomfortable feelings that we have about um, climate change. So those are all the sorts of things that psychologists spend a lot of time working with people on, which might be... Um, 
<sighs> moving their bodies and spending time in nature and talking with trusted others about how they're feeling and expressing their feelings and expressing their feelings maybe through having a cry or through artistic expression. Um, it involves, um, you know, having massages and releasing stress hormones through, you know, affectionate touch um, and all those sorts of things. So it's not necessarily tackling the problem of climate change, but it's all the other things that we do to help us manage the feelings. And then the third um, coping strategy uh, is meaning focused coping strategy. And this is one that um, people working in health field um, are perhaps not as familiar with, but Maria Ajala really I identified this as being one of the coping strategies that she found that young people were using to deal with climate change. And so meaning focused coping is sort of the things that we do with our thinking to change the meaning that climate change has to us or to change the way in which we think about climate change in order to be able to cope with it. So largely it's about um, generating a, a hopeful perspective, but we could talk endlessly about the different types of hope and, and how to develop hope. And I don't have time necessarily to talk about that, but that would be broadly one of the examples. But the three main strategies that Maria identified that young people were using were one, um, noticing how many other people around the world are caring about this problem that you also care about and taking heart from the fact that, you know, billions of people around the world care deeply about climate change or and or are actively working to do something about it. So that's one of the strategies. And another one is thinking about how really big problems um, like slavery and apartheid and women not having the vote and things like that have been um, tackled historically and how change has happened um, through history and taking heart from uh, realising that uh, humans have always confronted these enormous challenges at the, but at the time when they were in the middle of it felt insurmountable but through the dogged persistent efforts of people all over the world change happened and that's a sort of a, a hopeful <laughs> perspective as well and um, and the third one is um, thinking about some of the benefits of um, a, a zero carbon world, for example. And so being able to not just think about climate change and taking action on climate change as being, um, you know, suffering and deprivation, but to be imagining the world that we can create and the benefits that we will um, reap from a world where we're more interconnected and we're better at sharing and cooperating and sharing resources and where we're more involved in active transport and eating lower on the food chain all those sorts of things and being able to see that a, a, a better world is possible through concerted efforts to tackle climate change. Thank you Susie I mean I'm in just in you outlining Ojala's framework there, I feel a sense of positivity. I found that very uplifting. And uh, noting that we have some other folks to 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 get to, I just wanted to to ask you another question on the back of that. Um, how do you balance how much time you're spending on each of those three areas? Like, how do you keep that in check so that you're balancing the the meaning, the problem focused, and the emotional um, aspects? Is there is there a way we can uh, you know, reflect on that ourselves or get guidance from our friends or family or do we need more professional help in that context? Oh, no one's ever asked that question. That's <laughs> such an interesting question. I did run a workshop a little while ago where I said, write them up on the fridge and then if you're feeling really stressed, look at the three take the three coping strategies and go, ah, oh, I forgot to do emotion-focused coping, so now I need to get to work on some of them. So I don't have a particular answer for that, but it certainly is helpful to be being mindful of all three because they're all really legitimate, valuable strategies. Thank you, Susie. Um, we'll go to Carol next. Um, Carol, I'd love to ask, um, what led you to start up Psychology for a Safe Climate? And could you tell us a little bit more about what your organisation does? Thanks very much, Alice. Um, we, look, we started the group because um, I was working as a climate activist in the community and people started asking questions when they knew I was a psychologist saying, how can you help us understand why people are in denial about climate change. So it started off around that territory and then we formed a group of people who were interested to collectively as psychologists and psychotherapists to work together. And Susie helped us get together the first time. Um, when we 
decided to work together to um, help people with this issue. And also we started moving into a different uh, territory, which was supporting people emotionally who are working as climate activists. And um, as they were feeling greatly frustrated and, um, and inclined to perhaps um, become very despairing or to, to overwork and become burnt out, we also started working with those who were working on solutions as policy makers or scientists, um, researchers, and started working with them as, as groups in organisations to help them express the weight of the work they were doing, um, the distress they were feeling when policy was not shifting in the direction that they knew it needed to move in, and to help them connect, connect with their peers around the feelings that they were carrying around their work. And that helped build cohesiveness between the people working together. And it helped people reach out to each other if they were needing support rather than sort of working in silos. And then the third area that we gradually started working in was supporting people who are working as therapists to actually um, deal with their engagement with climate change because we knew that people were seeking out support from psychotherapists and psychologists and there wasn't really confidence by the, expressed by those people in um, supporting people. Sometimes the therapists weren't engaged themselves so they were not um, uh, sympathetic to the problems that people were bringing along and some were just feeling out of their depth. So we've started working to provide support to therapists through uh, professional development to help them deepen their engagement with climate change form connections with each other and, um, engage and, and discuss together how to best support people, whether they're young people or older people. So really the basis of our work now is helping people work together around this territory, around the emotional um, load that is carried with the people are therapists, researchers, policy makers, or parents that, or community uh, members that, they need each other. They need a place to talk about what they're feeling and so that they can actually support each other to support others. Thank you so much, Carol. Um, Louise, we'll come to you next. And I have uh, questions in a couple of parts for you. So I mentioned in your introduction um, that you are the director of the Sydney ACT Centre. Would you be able to share with us, for those of us who aren't as familiar as, as you and your colleagues, perhaps, what is acceptance and commitment commitment therapy, excuse me, and how um, can this be used to help manage uh, climate distress or anxiety? Sure. Uh, so ACT is, um, is an approach which is very much focused on the two parts of it. The acceptance part is very much about how we can handle the thoughts and feelings that we have in a way that's more effective so that we're not so pushed around by our thoughts and feelings. And the and that comes through sort of mindfulness skills. It comes through being able to step back and notice thinking rather than be quite so consumed and, um, and buy into a lot of the sort of stories that we might have uh, about things going on around us. And the commitment part is very much about living a, a values-based life. So it's very much about working out what's important to you. So big kind of questions like how do you want to spend the time that you have on this planet, being able to really think about what makes um, a meaningful and uh, fulfilling life. And so when it comes to climate change um, and being able to understand that the thoughts and feelings, we might have a lot of feelings, for instance, that um, are very understandable given what we're facing. So to be feeling anxious, to be feeling grief, to be feeling frustration, angry, helplessness, that all of those feelings um, are to be expected really if we are paying attention to what's going on in the world and that we can make room for those. But at the same time, we don't want to marinate in our feelings. So we want to be able to make room for them, but not actually to live according to what our feelings tell us. And that's where our values are really important. So rather than that we make decisions in life based on how we feel, that we use our feelings as information, but actually we're really much, very much guided by um, what's important to us and who we want to be. And so 
um, you know, feeling anxious about the state of the world. We want to make room for that. We want to acknowledge it. We want to notice all the thoughts and feelings that we might be having. And then we want to think about, well, what are the kinds of uh, values that matter? Like I want to be curious or I want to be, um, I want to contribute. And so then we can think about what can I do with my with my mouth, with my hands, with my feet that line up with those values and set goals that kind of um, that uh, fit with our the chosen values hopefully that kind of sums it up thanks louise yes it does um and i think um to ask you just a little bit more about one of the other hats that you're also wearing today um could you tell us a little bit more about the work that australian parents for climate action um are doing and then we might also ask for some resources or how to get involved in terms of both your work with the act center or act and also how folks could and uh, perhaps get involved in the Australian Parents for Climate Action um, work too. Sure. So Australian Parents, um, for me, has been just the most amazing home, I guess, that I've, I've found. And I would encourage everyone to kind of think about, if you don't already have one, to find your kind of home, because this work can be obviously very um, confronting and at times overwhelming. And I stumbled into Australian Parents. I can't even remember exactly, but I, I think I found it on Facebook. And it's uh, basically it's a nonpartisan group. It's very much about people being able to come together, people who care about children and the future. You don't have to be a parent. There's plenty of parents, carers, grandparents. Um, and really, it's a place where people can come and learn about climate change, where they can take action and also where they can find support. So it ends up being a bit of a community online, but also, um, you know, in different locations. And then there's also people will catch up to, well, before the pandemic, there were more opportunities and they're coming again to be able to get out on the streets and, and to protest and to ask for what we think is uh, is needed. But also things like, you know, writing to MPs and getting solar panels on schools and all sorts of things. So there's lots of different ways and around the country, I think, depending on where people are, that they might um, where parents because people, uh, you know, people um, look to parents. How do I put it? Like everyone loves their kids, right? Or everyone loves their, their grandkids or their people that they, their children that they care for. And so it's a really lovely way to come together. You don't have to have a, a background of, of uh, you know, chaining yourself to a tree or whatever, even though I have enormous respect for people who do that. But it's very much trying to bring in a lot of people who may not necessarily see themselves as climate activists, I think, is maybe one of the things that really has been good about just bringing in a whole group of different people. There's a, um, in terms of resources on the Australian Parents um, website, which is ap4ca.org, there's a great checklist, like a climate action checklist that might be worth um, checking out. And there's often things like at the moment, for instance, there's a um, there's a, a letter, like a template to write to Tanya Plibersek. So there's often just a, like a campaign where, you know, we can easily kind of um, send something off to our local MP or to other ministers uh, just to let them know what we think is uh, what we think matters and what we expect of our elected leaders. Uh, and in terms of resources on um, on ACT, um, in terms of specific resources around climate, uh, nothing kind of jumps out, but there are certainly, um, let me think, I mean, there's a whole stack of great books. Um, a Liberated Mind by Steve Hayes is, a, is an excellent book. There's The Reality Slap by uh, Russ Harris, which is a good one for, for when things kind of go wrong. Um, an old favourite of mine, which is not ACT, um, but, uh, but a great book is When Things Fall Apart from Pema Chodron, a uh, great Buddhist uh, work on when things go wrong in life. Um, and then, and again, not ACT, but I think um, a really great book that um, maybe others would also recommend is Active Hope um, by Joanna Macy. And I always forget... Uh, Chris Johnson. I always have a pile of books beside me that I'm going to talk about because otherwise I forget uh, the titles of them. But yeah, hopefully that answers. Thank you, Alice. Thank you so much, Louise. I think we're all scribbling down some books to go and get out of the library or to put <laughs> on a list for future presents. Um, so thank you for sharing. Um, we're now actually going to hear, we've got 
um, our wonderful panelists here, but we've also got some pre-recorded messages from um, two special people that we'll hear from now. So we're going to hear from um, Corey Tutt, who's the CEO and founder of Deadly Science, and also from Professor Emma Johnston, who's our uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research and was the lead author of the recent State of the Environment report. Um, and both Corey and Emma have recorded a message for us. So I think we will hear from them in just a moment before we come back to the panel. Yami yeah, Mob, Corey Tutt here from Deadly Science. And um, I'm here at the Matilda Centre on Gadigal Country, the Aurora Nation. And um, as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, our people are the first scientists, but we're also the first care of the country. And um, how I get through the climate crisis is I um, like to go for walks, I like to get amongst nature, um, I like to get amongst it. Um, the thing for me is that um, if we care for country, the country will care for you. And that is a lesson we should all take. Um, so as I get, you know, deal with the climate crisis, I try and go for walks, I try and get fresh air try and get my body moving, I try and get around it. Um, but it also is very concerning. And, um, you know, I think you should all stay deadly, stay safe. And um, remember, you um, we've only got one country and we've got to look after it. Yalu. Hi, everybody. And thanks for watching my little vignette. Um, I'm no expert psychologist, but here are some hot tips for how I deal with climate anxiety. First of all, Active transport, as I'm doing now, to get to an event. Good for your mind, good for your body, good for climate. Uh, eating less meat, red meat in particular. Good for the body, good for the mind, and good for the climate. Advocacy, very good for the mind. Um, pretty good for the body, I think. I'm not sure about that one, um, but definitely good for the climate. And finally, active restoration. There are so many. Uh, parts of Australia, our biodiversity that have been neglected or destroyed and getting your hands dirty and replanting or even weeding in marine environments if you've got the right support can be a really constructive thing to do and again good for your mind, good for your body and good for the climate and look at this stunning sunset. Well, thank you again to um Corey Tutt and Emma Johnston for those uh, lovely videos, those lovely contributions. And it was nice to finish with the image of the sunset just as the sun is setting here on, on campus at the University of Sydney today too. Um, we might jump off uh, those videos. I think I'd like to come to Sam and, and Cheryl first actually. So um, Emma uh, and Corey both shared some of their strategies for, for dealing with climate anxiety. And I think they actually probably touched on uh, some of the psychological strategies that Susie and Louise uh, mentioned uh, in, in the descriptions that they gave there too. But perhaps we'll start with you first, Sam. You know, as somebody who's working as a PhD researcher, doing your science, um, trying to, you know, um, uh, deal with some of the, the ups and downs of research that, 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 you know, find their way to you in the lab, how do you... Um, also stay engaged and, and cope with discussions around the climate and and how do you you know take a break from that when you need to it's a really tough question because um obviously it's a challenge that just doesn't it's not going away anytime soon and so obviously it takes up a lot of my mental capacity i go to work i think about this um and so yeah it can be really challenging to cope but at the same time i think that staying positive, focusing on solutions and trying to, for me, apply myself as much as I can is, uh, is something that's really important to me. And then in terms of staying up to date, I like to listen to a lot of different climate podcasts. Um, I listen to Catalyst. I listen to My Climate Journey, which is about, um, you know, everyone has their own climate journey with how they're learning with, uh, learning about the problem, learning about solutions. And then, you know, I, I talk about this stuff with a lot of my colleagues and other fellow PhD students. And something that makes me feel good and, and keeps me positive is the fact that all of us who are working on climate solutions tend to be very positive people, very solution oriented people. And um, I think that's really important. And it speaks a lot about kind of the direction that we're heading in. And I think that there's 
real room for improvement, obviously. Um, and so that's kind of how I, I keep myself motivated is, is working with other motivated people who are also optimistic. Thank you, Sam. Um, Cheryl, perhaps the same question to you particularly, do you have any advice for others? Um, and what do you, uh, you know, what, where do you find hope um, in some of these discussions? <laughs> I really resonated with what everyone said and especially Susie's words about how young people use meaning and I, I use that a lot too. I think about all the people like even here today who really care about this, who wants to make a change, that change does take time and that, you know, if we so work towards it, we can do it. And I like to imagine a better future as well, like what happens if our environment was carbon negative, like what would that look like for us? Like thinking not just of how the environment can worse can get better, but I think a lot of my hope comes from spending time with my loved ones, especially my niece and nephew, and wanting a better future with them and, you know, spending time with them out in the environment. We like, we love to go on walks in the park near my house and we play a little Pokemon game where they pretend Pokemon are in the park and stuff and just seeing them enjoy nature, talk about the bugs and animals and insects makes me feel hope for the environment and makes me feel encouraged and want to keep that going. And knowing that people love nature, they love where we are, love, we love our climate and we just want to do what we can to support them brings me that hope and being part of nature and walking and stuff reminds me of that and this is what I'm working towards. Thanks Cheryl. It strikes me that both from your answers and many of the folks on the panel today that it's um, it, it's it's kind of a, amazing that we can seek um, some of that solace and support from nature in the same even though that's what we're trying to to think about looking after too. It's It sort of gives back and um, when we and we think about ways that we can better look after nature and our environment too. Um, I'm now going to go to some questions, first of all, um, from uh, some that were submitted when people registered for the panel. I note there's a few questions in the Q&A and I'll definitely come to at least uh, one or two of those in a moment. Um, I think we, we have uh, three questions there. If you have any questions and you are a participant, please do add a question um, to the Q&A tab. Um, but first of all, I'd like to go to Carolyn Louise with this question and ask you, how is managing anxiety in particularly climate anxiety in young people different to managing anxiety or climate anxiety in people who are older? Perhaps Louise first and then I'll come to you, Carol. Aha, uh -huh, OK. Look, I think. Mm -hmm. I, I think some of the dilemmas that younger people have are going to be different than our um, ones. So I, I'm 50, so I'm kind of halfway, I guess, depending on how, how long I hang around. But if you're a younger person, you might have dilemmas. I, I guess possibly one of the biggest ones we hear about is the choice of whether to become a parent uh, in the climate emergency, which I just can't imagine. It's, it's such a huge thing to be thinking about. So that's one of the sort of um, managing some of the anxiety around those kinds of dilemmas and decisions, I think is something that I would see as different. I guess also um, it's also going to be different just because people, when they're in their, you know, in their teens and 20s, they've got their whole life ahead of them and they are also looking into a future that um, is really quite scary. Um, you know, so I think that's going to be quite different. And so I would manage that differently because it's you want to validate and really hear, I think, you know, really, really listen to what people are concerned about and what their unique experience and what their concerns are. I mean, I know with my kids are 9 and 11, and sometimes the things that they worry about, I might not quite understand or it's so long since I had those same concerns. But I think that, you know, really just being able to be listening and respecting where people are at and what it is that's on their minds. Um, so I think they're probably the sorts of things. Actually, one other quick thing. I'm, um, I know when I was a lot younger and when I hear um, my, my stepdaughter who's 17 or when I hear, you know, young people have that sort of sense of ideal, idealism and they just are 
see things, I think, in a, such a beautiful, pure way, like, you know, that it's, things are right or wrong. And, and I think that that kind of really impacts in terms of anxiety because it's like it's so hard to understand, so shocking, I think, when you're younger to think, well, why the hell, you know, has this been allowed to happen or why the hell hasn't someone stopped this? And I feel it at my age, but I know that my younger self would have just been so much more horrified and shocked and angry that, that these sorts of things have been allowed to happen. So I think that's probably, I don't know if that kind of answers, but that's how I think about anxiety for younger people. Thanks, Louise. And, and Carol, would you like to share any of your perspectives? Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Louise. Um, look, I think that we have to uh, recognise that young people, many of them, are very, very aware of the climate science and the urgency of the problem, and probably their peer influence in terms of um, gathering that understanding of the critical situation we're in is probably uh, much more widespread among some young people than adult groups. And Greta Thunberg's been quite a leader in that in terms of um, leading the world with young people knowing that the climate science um, is not actually telling us that we've got a good future, that there needs to be urgent action, that we're not taking the scale of change that's necessary. So I think it's we really have to respect the young people and what they know about the situation and how um, un unstable their future is. And that we do know from research that was done by Avaz around researching 10,000 young people from 10 countries around the world, that 75% um, of them said that they thought the future was frightening. And many of them expressed their anger and sense of betrayal that, that the governments around the world were not taking the action that's, that's um, really needed. Now, as we know that some adults feel like that, but I think young people are very much onto it. Their, their peer influence and peer knowledge is really maybe a long way ahead of some adults. So we need to be re very respectful of that. And we do, as Louise say, we need to listen to their feelings and validate their feelings um, and also encourage them to um, join with others to do what they can. And maybe also parents can join with their, their kids in doing things that um, are, as Louise is talking about, through Parents for Climate Action or whatever is available to make some submissions or, or um, petitions to, to government or actions that are demonstrate the concern they have. Thank you so much, Carol. Um, I think we'll go to one of our questions in the Q&A. Um, there's a few in here from Noni. If I, um, I should also say that the last question was from Angela in New South Wales. So thank you for that question, Angela. Um, and we'll go to one from Noni. I apologise if I mispronounce anybody's name. I'm doing my, my best here. Um, so Noni says that they are so concerned about the effects of actually telling the truth around the effects of climate change and notes that, of course, it doesn't only affect young people. How do we tell the truth, knowing that Australia is the most vulnerable continent in the world? How do we help young and old work through their despair and move to action? I've been a climate activist for a couple of decades and I'm losing hope. And I might go to Susie there because you spoke about hope um, in, in your earlier answer. Well, that's a super question because <laughs> that's what people always worry about is how much truth to tell about the problem and it's been much debated in science in social science as well the the the, the problem of how much truth do you tell and what what are the impacts that that has on people so there is you know a literature that shows that if people get frightened and they don't know what to do about their fears that they risk then switching off from the problem and distracting themselves endlessly with popular culture and other things that we can endlessly distract ourselves with and then aren't engaged with the problem of climate change anymore so as a general rule of thumb we crudely say that you can um, afford to frighten people to the extent that you can give them a lot to do to reduce the threat of the thing that they are frightened about. So we always need to pair the truth telling 
um, about climate change with all of the different ways in which people can get engaged with solutions. So that's sort of a, a first point. Um, and there's much that um, psychologists have written about the importance of truth as a galvanizing force. And, you know, without being able to face the reality of the enormous threat we um, you know we can't summon the energy that is necessary um, but there's also a big literature on the importance of also working from a starting place of looking at solutions and that being able to envision a future that is a zero carbon world that's been transformed greatly through renewable industries and you know many other things and being able to imagine the future what awakens in us then the energy to be able to work out what are the steps to move towards that future and um, and so that's about picturing a future that you desire, so you might start from a place of um, being aware of the tr truth or the reality of the threat, but by imagining the future that we want to work towards, that's a critically important, that's part of that meaning focus coping, then, then we can start to take the steps towards doing something about it, and that's what the definition of active hope is. Thanks, Susie. And it strikes me that that's also an important message for folks who are communicating uh, the climate emergency too, to balance um, some of those aspects there in, in truth telling, but also combining um, some of those rather scary truths with opportunities for people to, to, to make change or to contribute to activism or, um, or other projects that, that can help have a positive social impact and for climate change too. So there's a lot to think about um, there. Um, I think you've partly um, answered a question from Carmen there, but I might um, jump off this idea of imagining a, be a better future. So Carmen in New South Wales um, asks, what's the role of imagining better futures in alleviating climate and anxiety and empowering social action? Um, and I might just go to, to Louise there and see if you have anything to add um, to, to, to Susie's point about this imagined uh, futures. Yeah, so I, I think it's a um, I think it's a really good question. I, I come back to this idea that if you can't see it, you can't be it. So you know, if we want to, um, it's that working towards something, right? Like like Susie's talking about. So I do think that that's really important. I, I don't think that um, you know feeling hopeful isn't going to save us, but actively doing things as though you know, like if we if we get into a very pessimistic mindset, uh, we might just all sit at home and watch Netflix and drink a hell of a lot and do nothing, and that's going to do none of us any good. And I think it was actually Sir David Attenborough. I, I think I heard in a podcast a couple of years ago talking about. Um, you know, almost like the moral obligation we have. So regardless of how we feel that we are moving towards a positive future, that we are doing the things that create the world that we that we want to see. And um, another one of my favourite books, actually, is almost at the top of my pile, The Future We Choose, um, by uh, Christiana um, Figueres and Tom Rivet Karnick, and one of my favourite podcasts, Outrage and Optimism, uh, that they do. So I think imagining that positive future is is, um, is really important. Our minds naturally go to problems. So, you know, language came about by trying to, you know, stay safe, not get eaten by wild animals and uh, stay in a tribe and so forth. But if we can focus, like actively go out, whether it be a gratitude journal, whether it be that we, we search for news that is actually um, more positive, um, that we read about, you know, places that are doing really amazing things like in Wales where they have a minister um gosh what's the title basically they have a minister that um had, there's a lens where uh, any decision that happens in infrastructure or transport or whatever has to go through the minister for future generations I think the title is so you know there are these amazing things happening all around the world that we can look to and we can be very hopeful for but it's certainly not going to happen just by wishing for it right so it's not it's not blind hope it's uh, very very much active 
Thank you, Louise. I think we know where to come if we want to borrow some books. It looks like you've got a great pile on your desk there. Um, Cheryl, I might come back to you if that's uh, if that's OK. Um, I noticed in your introduction or we noticed in your introduction, you were speaking about um, some lived experience of recent um, climate um, events, uh, extreme weather events like bushfire, fire, excuse me, the bushfires and the flooding. Um, and I wondered if you might share a little bit of your perspective on what impact those events have had on youth mental health and also potentially share um, some of the positives that have come out of, um, well, not positives of those events, but positives that have come out um, in discussions or community around um, young people. Thanks, Alice. I think that's a really great um, question that you asked. I think for me, I didn't personally experience the bushfires, but a lot of my colleagues in the Youth Advisory Board did. And we discussed a lot about how it impacted the community and us and how we could contribute to any changes that made. And although we couldn't do anything about the actual British fires, we did talk about family members or friends who were able to be part of the recovery effort, to volunteer to help fight the bushfires or even raise awareness about. And just even though that even though we can't be there physically for each other, we could support each other by discussing this. Because sometimes I feel like not talking about climate change and acting like it doesn't exist can hurt young people because we are very aware that it exists. And when we see people who pretend it doesn't or nothing's done, it can be really frustrating. So having an avenue to talk about it and having actions to protectively take care of the one was really helpful for us. During the Queensland floods, um, which I experienced, I just happened to move to Queensland and the flooding came. So that was a rather interesting experience. Um, although the floods were bad for my mental health, it actually made me review my life a bit because when you're in lockdown in your house because of all the flooding, you really realize what the important things in your life, what rallies you want to carry, and I think that gave me perspective on how I want to go with my um, life, like who do I want to interact with, what type of work I want to do. And that's kind of the reason why I am here today, because I'm like, in my time, I really want to make a difference to the future for young people and everyone who's on this earth today and, you know, help the environment and being part of this and showing my friends and other young people that, this opportunity is real. There's other people who is out there fighting with us um, that, you know, everyone from all generations can contribute has been really helpful and has given hope to some of my friends who are looking to find jobs in this area or volunteering in this area and know that, you know, that there are YV boards, that their program, their work you can actually do. Like here, Sam's doing PhD you know, to look at carbon emissions and how we can get objects to absorb them. Like, these are all real avenues that we can take action for. So I love, I think that's the impact it has on youth mental health. Like, it can impact us during that moment and we might not feel the best, but afterwards it gives us a time to reflect and go, hey, maybe I can be part of the change and use this not to bring me down, but improve my health and make it better, not just for me, but for everyone else. Thank you so much, Cheryl. What a what a wonderful answer. Um, Sam, I'm going to come to you next with a slightly modified version of a question from Pradeep in New South Wales. So um, Pradeep asks, what different strategies could we use to advocate the main climate issues better? And I wondered if you as a scientist could comment on, you know, how well are scientists doing at this? Or what could we as scientists do better to try and advocate for um, climate issues? Uh, in, in a more um, effective way. I think it goes back to the point that Susie made, which is that focusing on positive action and positive solutions is really motivating. And when you think about the future that's possible, I think that that makes politicians better understand, you know, why they should take action. You can imagine a future with a more stable climate, healthier ecosystems, but beyond that, abundant clean energy, um, you know, access to clean transportation and livable cities. These are all things that would drastically improve everyone's quality of life. 
And I think focusing on how climate solutions can have impacts on health and quality of life beyond just the climate is a, is a real motivator. Um, and so I think that translating our solutions, the, the ones that we're working on in the lab, into how they affect everyone's day-to-day -day lives, I think that's a, a big motivator. Thanks so much, Sam. I'm going to squeeze one more question in. I know we're we're getting very close to the to the hour, um, but we have a question from Amanda in New South Wales, and this one's to Susie. First of all, um, could you um, share with us what you think the role of climate activism is as a strategy for managing climate anxiety? Well, it's a good example of problem focus coping, so mm -hmm. it gets a tick in that respect. But also importantly, um, it's uh, it's a way of being able to join with big groups of people. And one of the things that we know from the literature is that when people just focus on individual or household level action around climate change, um, there's you know, it engages them as somebody who cares about the environment. But the problem with it is that it can often lead to a feeling of helplessness and hopelessness because it's overwhelming and one person can't possibly do something about it. And, um, and anyway, somebody I read once said, and anyhow, a narcissistic focus on the self is never a healthy thing to have. Um, and so the importance with the... Um, you know, the, 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 the sort of the larger scale group actions is that it's um, it's more impactful. It helps mm. you feel that there's a community around you. So it's got all those benefits as well. Plus, it's more likely to get some attention. So that's why the school strike movement that Greta tipped off in Sweden have been so fabulous for young people. I mean, for many of the young people, that was when they first did learn about climate change. But to be with a large number of people all around the world is so heartening and valuable. So, from those pers from you know from those perspectives, I think it's fantastic. Thank you so much, Susie. And I'm I'm really sad that that's actually all we've got time for today. This hour seems to have really passed so quickly, thanks to the generosity of the contributions of our panel and the fantastic questions from those of you who've joined today. And really, I think tonight has been in part about community, building community around um, some of these really challenging uh, issues and discussions. So thank you for joining this community this evening. And for those of you who are watching, um, this on the Matilda Center YouTube channel in the future. Um, we, we say hello to you too. Apologies to anyone who didn't get their questions answered today. We will do our best um, to answer you if you have a chance to get in touch with us via email at the Matilda Center. Um, and there will be, there's also links up on, on the, the webpage too. Um, and we will also would just like to say that we'd like to share those support numbers again um, that, and links that we shared at the top of, of uh, today's discussion um, for anybody who has been impacted by any of the discussions today. Uh, please take care of yourself and do reach out for some um, some help if, if you if you are experiencing any distress. Um, and with that. I would just like to say thank you so much for participating in tonight's youth mental health for youth mental health forum. Excuse me, um, uh, it's been wonderful to have you here. Uh, we would love it if you could take a moment to complete a survey that's going to pop up um, once we've ended this Zoom webinar. But thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's been lovely um, to be here with you, um, and have a wonderful evening. <laughs>